All right. So today we've moved past all the introductory stuff, and I'm sorry we had a, we kind of the last I mean not last week we met for a prayer meeting, but the week a couple weeks leading up to that we kind of did some recap of what we talked about, but it had been five or six weeks, and so I wanted it kind of more fresh in our minds uh, as we started moving forward because we're going to refer back to a lot of what we talked about the last couple weeks. Uh, a lot of what we're going to talk about is dependent on topology and on understanding the law gospel distinction, all those kind of things we talked about the last couple weeks. If you're confused as to what I just said because you weren't here, that's fine. Um, these, we have these, uh, we record all these, and I'm pretty sure they're all on our YouTube page, which is, I think, hidden, but I'm not 100% sure. Ask Chase. He'll know exactly where that is. But I wanted to kind of lay out some, some, uh, some groundwork for us, kind of foundation work for us for moving forward. Uh, I'm gonna, today we're going to talk about the covenant of works, which we've already talked about before, but I'm going to kind of approach it in a different way. Um, I put these up here on the board. I think these will help us. Uh, I've had, we had several questions. I had several questions about covenants fit, individual covenants fit. And this has been a helpful framework for me is to think of them as, co- as different covenants fa- falling under different kingdoms. Um, so you have the kingdom of creation, which affects all peoples. You have the kingdom of Israel, which reflects a particular people in a particular kind of place. You have the kingdom of Christ, which also... Pr- um, is directed towards a particular people, um, but this particular people is not necessarily in a particular time and place, but all who believe throughout history on all places. Does that make sense? And so these three categories help us think through that. So when I think about the kingdom of Christ, you think about uh, the covenant of redemption. Remember, what's the covenant of redemption? Yeah, God's plan before the foundation of the world to save people for himself. And so, um, what, what do we call that? So that's his plan before time began. Some people call it a covenant of peace. If you, will, if you go back far enough to some old Reformed writers, um, the, the Paxum Salutum, they call, they call it. So, uh, what, what is this worked out in real time? So this is God's plan before the foundation of the world. Grace. Yeah, so the covenant of grace would fall under here. And I'm saying that's the same thing as the promise of the new covenant. What would be the kingdom of creation? This is what we're looking at today, covenant of works. Or we'd say the covenant made with Adam. Anything else fall under here? No, but we're going to get to them. Noah. Yeah. Covenant with Noah. Noah. Here, is Mary's answer, what are the covenants that fall under the kingdom of Israel? Abraham. What's the first one? Covenant with Abraham? Yeah, Abraham. Covenant with Moses? Yeah. Covenant with David? My argument is that these covenants deal with the exact same group of people, different aspects of the same group of people. In, he, in here, this is where it gets a little tricky. So these, these kind of help keep them straight in our head. In here, in the, in the Adamic covenant, you have, and we're talking about this a little bit today, you have the promise of the new covenant. And in here, you have that kind of seed start to germinate and kind of start to grow out, but it doesn't come to fruition until here. Does that make sense? So a lot of people go, oh, well, see, like, in the, there are people that are saved inside the covenant of Abraham. Like, is it, we've read Hebrews 11. There are Old Testament saints who are saved. And we go, they're saved through this by this. They're not saved by these covenants. They're saved by this. They're saved by Christ in the midst of them being also under this covenant. Um, so you ha- Abraham is the perfect example of this. You, you could go, so Abraham is the father of kind of two groups of people. Right? Those that are his seed by natural what's the word i'm looking for selection. not natural selection <laughs> someone was trying to get me to say that that's a, <laughs> yeah, so by by natural generation by by just human means his children by the flesh and then you have those who are his spiritual children who are those who are his who are his phys, who his physical offspring versus spiritual offspring who are his spiritual offspring all who would believe, all who would believe right and so that that contrast between his physical offspring and spiritual offspring are the same uh, is made throughout the New Testament, right? 
You are not of your father Abraham. You are of your father the devil, he says to the Pharisees. They're going, this? Abraham's our father. We are his physical seed. Therefore, because we belong to the covenant of Abraham, we belong to the covenant of grace. We're going to be saved. And he goes, no, 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 you're misunderstanding. The covenant of grace ran through the covenant of Abraham, but it's not the same thing. His spiritual children are those who are saved. And so that's the, that's the that's, by the way, that's the, uh, the big discussion with the Presbyterians. They would say, the covenant of Abraham is the covenant of grace. And I'll go, no, no, no. There are people in the covenant of Abraham who are not saved. I mean, that was, that's, Jesus goes to great pains to show us that, that truth. And so only those who belong to him are those who are saved. And so uh, this, this, I th- hopefully this will help you as you're thinking through this. Today, for our, our lesson, we're going to focus on just the covenant of works. We're going to focus just on this today. And hopefully in our time, hopefully we get through it. I'm using, I'm going to use Sam Rinhan's uh, structure for this because I think it's fantastic. Um, I've recommended this book to you multiple times. I'm stealing liberally from it uh, because I think it's really well done. But his structure for, for teaching through the covenant works is this. You basically have three, like a very good Baptist structure, right? Three alliterated points. I mean, that's, that's it. Man's created condition, man's covenantal condition, man's cursed condition. We're going to spend most of our time talking about this. But... It's helpful to understand what man was created, how man was created, what, what man is like under the covenant, and what man was like in his curse condition. It's all related just to the covenant of work. So let's jump in to that there. Let me pray for us, and we'll begin our time together. Father God, we pray that you will help us to, to use our minds well to glorify you. Teach us what your word says. Help us to, um, to not invent things or to bring things in that are not what we see in your word, but that help us to understand your word well. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll help me to do that, help us as a class to do that, and we pray that this is all to the end of your glory, for your name's sake. In the, in the name of our Savior Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay. So, the whole biblical doctrine of the covenant of works, I think, depends on this distinction between what is natural to Adam at creation and that which was given beyond nature. That's what we talked about last week, right? What is, what is it that is natural, and what is it that has to come by God doing something special and different than what's by nature? By nature, all people owe obedience to God. True or false? Why? What? Because he's God. That's the creator-creature distinction. The creator has the right to do whatever he wants with his creatures and ask of them whatever they want. And listen, and here's the key part. And there is no reward for such obedience. There's no reward for that. That is, that is demanded in the fact that we are creatures. Then, God chooses, out of his own grace and kindness, to enter into a special relationship with his creation, where he gives them the opportunity to, to get something else, a reward of, of some sort. And that reward is, is hinged on dependent on obedience. Now, do we have anything else in our society that uh, we do that with? Can you think about your own households, maybe? Children are to obey their parents, right? Is there a reward for obedience to your parents, in that sense? That they'll live long. That they'll live long. <laughs> that, that they'll live in the land and go, it'll go well with them. Yeah? That's, a good, that's a good thing to take from. But, 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 and that's really, the, that's really kind of the extent of natural, of the result of a natural creator creature um, hierarchy ex- expectation is that at best you can expect better life, long, longer life, a more enjoyable life, right? Because you're not constantly fighting against the, the man. That's not the same thing as a covenant or agreement. So God chooses to enter into a covenant where he basically gives Adam a, a promise that's guar- it's a guaranteed commitment that's divinely sanctioned with the hope for blessing for obedience, but punishment for disobedience. There's stipulations. There's expectations placed on man. But man's created condition, God forms man, is... Man good or bad? We're created to seek, created condition. And it's good. Right? God declares it very good. Seven times in Genesis 1, he, he de- uh, declares his creation good. 
And he sums this up in Genesis 131, calling man very good, exceedingly good. Being part of creation, man as body and soul is created in the image of God. It's good. And the natural and inherent goodness and blessedness of man sets the stage for what God promises to give beyond that natural relationship. By nature, Adam was created to obey God in all things. By nature, though, God was not required to reward Adam's obedience with anything, anything other than justice. Um, which basically acknowledges that a work has been done well. And so, Genesis 1 tells us that. Genesis 2 creates a pattern for us where we see that God enters into a different kind of relationship with Adam. Right, and so there you have Genesis 1, Genesis 2. Why are, they, why are the accounts slightly different? Well, because they're highlighting different things. You're kind of zooming in on this relationship between God and man in Genesis 2. They offer sort of complementary perspectives, accounts, that God placed before Adam the possibility of attaining something beyond just his created condition. And so Genesis 1, big macroscopic perspective. Genesis 2, microscopic, right? So in, G in Genesis 1, Adam is to have dominion over all the earth. He's commissioned to fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 1, Genesis 1 basically designates the entire created world as a realm over which Adam is to exercise dominion. That's the whole goal of, of, of Genesis 1 is God created all things, and then God placed man as the, as the vice regent, the king of sorts over that creation. God's the big king. Adam's the steward king. Make sense? Now, he must fill the earth. He must subdue it. And God sits enthroned in eternal rest, laying out a pattern for Adam to follow, doing the same. Work, rest. Work, rest. Sorry. Work, rest. I got to go backwards. Work, rest. The universal kingdom task begins there. And God chose Eden to be that place. And so Genesis 1 sets the stage for the scope of the covenant of works, but Genesis 2 is the covenant of works. Does that make sense? Genesis 1 provides that scope. All right, so that's man's created condition. Here's where we're going to spend the most of our time. Man's covenantal condition. All right, so a covenant is what? Don't look up on the board. What is a covenant? It's a commitment. With, not necessarily, it could be more one-sided. A, com a commitment with stipulations, with sanctions, right? And so threats of, threats of punishment for disobedience, threats of reward for, I mean, promises of reward for obedience. So a covenant is a commitment with divine sanctions, a divinely sanctioned, guaranteed commitment, right? God placed Adam under commitments beyond his created obligations, he added sanctions to basically guarantee Adam's participation in this covenant. And he committed to provide a reward for Adam's obedience, a reward that was unavailable apart from God providing it uniquely. Yeah. Sorry. It's all right, man. <laughs> That's hilarious. James, I appreciate that. <laughs> That's hilarious. <clears throat> All right. So, seven points. If anyone's taking notes, there's seven points that we're going to talk about underneath man's covenantal condition. How God relates to Adam in this covenant. Seven points. You ready? Number one, God places Adam in the Garden of Eden. All right. So, Genesis 1 pre pre presents this whole scene of heaven and earth. Right. And so, we see, remember the whole format of God that... That on these days, God is creating kind of the areas of his kingdom. And then the next, he kind of goes through the, kind of creating these areas. And then he comes back through and he fills them with stuff that is going to worship him in those areas. Right? So he creates the skies and he fills them with birds. And he creates the land. He creates, he fills it with, with uh, man and with animals. And he creates the heavens and the earth. And he fills them with the, bod the heavenly bodies. Right? He does all these things on these days. I, I, clearly that was out of order. Right? Um, but he does all these things and fills them up. Um, Genesis 2 kind of focuses in, not on the, the giant moon and stars and the sky and all the stuff that God's created, but it focuses in on a garden. And so, 
Um, in the entirety of the cosmos that God creates, we read in Genesis 2.8, the Lord God planted a garden in Eden. In the east, and there he put man who he, whom he had formed. So man wasn't formed in the garden. Man was formed outside the garden, but God created a garden and put man in the garden. Genesis 2.8. Eden was not man's natural location. Adam was formed, then Eden was prepared, and then Adam was placed in it. The description of Eden tells us the purpose for which Adam was placed there. The garden contains the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam was placed in this garden to work it and to keep it. Right? The biblical description of Eden, what does it remind us of? We've talked about this some before in the past. What does Eden remind us of? That we see the kind of imagery that we see throughout the Old Testament. Heaven. What? Heaven. Heaven. More normal than that. What do, or, how, what do we see throughout the Old Testament that points us back to Eden? Maybe that's a, a better way to ask that. Temple. You said temple, right? Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, temple. That's exactly right. What makes a temple special? The presence of God is there. Right? And there's numer numerous features in the text that kind of remind us of this, right? Uh, it's eastern designation. That's a big point in temples. Uh, mountaintop location, rivers, trees, precious stones and metals. Like, those are all things that are, that whenever the temple's described, those are the things that kind of keep coming up. Well, they're referring back to Eden. And so, you know, you're reading through Genesis 2, and it doesn't seem very significant. It seems like, oh, you're just giving us some, some kind of imagery. But as you read the rest of the Old Testament, you're like, where did we hear that before, all these stones and metals? Which is why when you get to Revelation and you see the same things again, you go, oh, wait a second. Wait, there's a tree here? And there's all these stones and metals, and there's a river, and all, all this kind of stuff. Okay. All right, Eden was a, was a template for the temple. Right? And so all the rest of the imagery and language comes from that. It's in an elevated mountaintop location. Water flowed out of it. And so um, God's presence is there. I mean, which is, so I kind of did that whole, that whole lesson on how God's presence, God meets with his people in mountains. And so that's the picture of Eden. Eden was a, Eden was a garden on a mountain. All this imagery is kind of rolled into one here. All right. Uh, Throughout the history of redemption, how does, how, do sin, how does sin relate to temples, God's temple? They go, to, they go together hand in hand. Well, does God do anything to protect his presence in his temple? What does he do? Okay, so you can't even go into God's presence because it's hidden in the most holy place, the holy of holies. But that's just one door, right? To get into the Holy of Holies? I know there's a series of ever-increasingly difficult places to get into, to, in, to enter the presence of God. Um, what is the job of the priests if, they were, if people were to try to violate that? What does the priest have to do? Yeah, kill them. Yeah, you have to kill them. It's like uh, um, <laughs> when we went to the... This can't happen. In America, we're too polite with stuff, right? We're like, please, please don't do this. You can't go there. Um, uh, and you think it was bad. When we went to Italy and, and went to the Sistine Chapel, like, you know, you walk in Sistine Chapel, and whole, there's, like, signs that say, like, you know, you be quiet, no picture taking. And, you know, you walk in, and there's immediately guards are like, silencio, you know, like. <laughs> and then they we're, we're there, and someone was trying to sneak pictures, and the the guard came up and, and basically took their, their phone and went through and deleted everything that was there. Like, show me your, like, we would, like, people would have a, a, a fit. That's a southern term here. They'd have a conniption if they had it, uh, if they did that here, right? But there, what's the, the idea? Well, they're, they're there to guard and protect the, the s sacredness of the Sistine Chapel. And I'm glad they do because it would be a r horrible visit if it was loud and people were all crazy and just taking pictures everywhere, it kind of ruins the whole vibe of the place. That's a small little picture of when, when there are things that are sacred, we do things to protect them. Where do we get that idea from? Well, it's, it's this, that, that when something is sacred, that not e just everything can come into its presence. In fact, 
to pull from Italy again, you can't go into the churches there with bare shoulders, ladies, or shorts, guys. You go, that's, that's insane, is it? Right? I mean, there, there's, this, there's this coming from somewhere. Well, the picture of, of the temple is that nothing, nothing that could defile the temple is allowed into it. What's the problem with, with that when we're talking about defiling the temple? What from the outside defiles the temple? The answer is everything, right? Everything is, is sinful in that sense. Everything can defile it. So you can't let any human beings in there unless, and then they go through this whole deal about the high priest can on this day of the year after he does A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, up. Then he can enter into the presence of God. The tabernacle, the temple, even the Holy Land of Israel were to be kept pure from sin. Right? What happens to people even in the people, within the people of Israel if they, if they commit sins of that sort? They're thrown out, right? Because ever increasingly, moving towards the most holy place, even the people of Israel were to be undefiled, right? By the way, this is the same kind of language that's used uh, in 1 Corinthians to talk about the believer being a temple of God and therefore why we should not participate in acts of immorality, right? Because you are, don't you know you're a temple? You can't defile the temple of God, right? That's not a statement about uh, tattoos, which is, what, have, did you hear that growing up? That's what I heard. You wouldn't graffiti the temple of God. That's not, I don't think that's what he's going for. The point is, you don't, the temple can't be defiled with sin. The temple is to be kept holy. So where are the members of your temple going? Are they going to this place or that place? Are they looking at this? Are they participating in this? What is it they're doing? Right, that's the picture. That's the picture there. All drawn from this temple imagery. And so, God made Eden to be a temple sanctuary in which his presence would be manifest, and he placed Adam there to work and keep it. It's Adam's job to protect the temple. And so God created Adam as essentially a prophet, a priest, and a king. It's the job of the priest to protect the temple. We're going to come back to that in just a second. That's point one. God placed Adam in the garden. Point two, God appointed Adam as federal head over his natural offspring. I'm really thankful that Dr. Newton talked about some of this last week. I mean, I've been hitting on kind of federal headship for a while, but I thought what he walked through in, in Romans was really helpful, um, seeing how it's important for us to understand being connected to a federal head. God appointed Adam federal head over his natural offspring. And you go, where would you find this argument? And I ask you, where would you find this argument? Two places in the New Testament. I reference them often. Two places in the New Testament. Romans 5. Romans 5. <laughs> yeah, there's hints. There's no doubt he, he, is, he is alluding to that very fact. And there's no doubt. That's not what I'm thinking of, though. 1 Corinthians 15 is the other place that you see this really laid out, right? In 1 Corinthians 15, we read that Adam, in Adam all die, right? 15, 22. The end of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 47 through 49, basically elaborate on this principle. Here's what Paul says. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven, right? He's contrasting, he's contrasting Adam Trusting Jesus. As was the man of dust, so also are all those who are of dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are all those who are of heaven. Just as we have been born in the image of man of the dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Right? So the picture is all those who are born like Adam, share in Adam's nature, they have him as a federal head because they're born just like he is. All those who are born of Christ, born again, Share this nature. Right? Does that make sense? Now, everyone who is over here, born of Christ, was, was, is this also, but they've been transferred over into to this. Make sense? So, all humanity save Christ, except Christ, Christ and all who belong to him. 
Those are the federal heads. As goes the king, so goes the kingdom. That's the principle of federal headship, which is a principle that's laid out throughout the Old Testament. Isn't that what we see throughout the Old Testament? As goes the king, so goes the kingdom. When, there's, when there are good kings over the people, the people prospered. And what was the sign of them being a good king? Give me some idea. Give me some idea. How do we know they're a good king? Read all of the law. Write it down. Go. The, he brings the people back to the law. Then, what else does he do? Protects the people. From who? From enemies. From those outside the kingdom that want to destroy them. And again, we talked about this with the cycle of judges a couple weeks ago. It's the same thing with the cycle of kings, right? You have, you have when there are good kings... They're tearing down the high places that the previous kings have allowed up for idolatry. They're tearing those things down and going, no, we are going to worship the Lord our God. That's who we're going to worship. And they're leading the people back to God. And then that king dies. And what happens? New king comes in. And people are just like, man, I just hope this one's a good king. Well, kingdom split. How many good kings did Israel have? Zero. How many good kings did Judah have? I'm not asking for an exact number. It was a mixed bag. Right? And then the prophets come in, and they're prophesying against the kings. Remember, they're prophesying against the shepherds of Israel, and like, you've destroyed the people. You've just used the people for, to get rich and fat. The, you're, you're using them, I mean, literally, he says, you're using them to get, to get the fat off the people so that you can eat and be filled and to, to fill your own pockets with gold. And the people are like, man, we just want a good king. Cycle of Judges was that desire for people to have deliverance from the enemy and desire for a judge that would never die. Same thing. If only we could have a king who would lead us to God, protect us from the enemies of God, and then not die. That's the hope. We want that kind of king. Because as goes the king, so goes the kingdom. How did Adam do with his job as king? God sets him up over all the earth. Here's your responsibility. He messed up pretty quickly. I mean, I don't know how long it took, but he messed up. Christ, what does he do? Fulfills all righteousness. Brings his people to to God. Wipes out the enemies of God. Destroys Satan, sin. Right? This is, brings his people to eternal life. These are all things that Christ does as federal head. Right? Adam's federal headship is evident in Genesis 1 and 2. He is to fill the earth with his offspring. Right? Now, in Genesis 128, there's kind of a broad commission for Adam and Eve to do that, right? The imperatives related to filling the earth are, are, are for, to both of them. But um, the universal scope of Genesis 1 must be connected with its kind of restatement in Genesis 2, where Adam is created, placed in the garden, charged with its royal responsibilities, its priestly responsibilities, and he's the one to whom God speaks. There's, he's a prophet. He receives the word of God prior to the creation of Eve. So his prophet, priest, and king role is highlighted by God before he ever creates Eve. Then it makes sense when he creates Eve as a helper to him. Here's these responsibilities given to him, and hey, guess what? Here's how biology works. You can't do this unless you have her. Like, that's a lesson we need today, right? Like, I don't know if you know how biology works, but... That's how kids in here, you can talk to your parents about that. That's how biology works. Eve's creation was for the purpose of helping Adam carry out the responsibilities that God gave him. Right? But it runs through Adam. That's why when they both fell, who's held responsible? Adam is. We don't say, see, through one man and woman, sin entered the world. That's an accurate statement. But the theological statement is the federal headship of Adam. Adam was given the responsibility, and therefore he's the one who fell. And so beyond his created role, beyond his job uh, as, as uh, the one who was supposed to fulfill the, or fill the earth with his offspring, Adam was placed in a sanctuary, given the responsibility as federal head over that, over his, all his natural offspring. All mankind fell under him. He is the federal head. That's point two. Number three. We're having to go quicker. 
God obligates Adam to a law of obedience. And here's where we start to see kind of the covenant take its shape. So beyond just, you're my creation, Adam, you have to obey me, here is God going, Adam, I'm going to ask of you some special requirements that you must do. By nature, Adam owed obedience to God. Right? So beyond the law of nature that's written on the heart of man, God gives Adam a positive law. That's why we spent so much time the last couple of weeks talking about natural law and positive law. Positive law, what are positive laws? Does anyone remember? Stated. Positive laws are stated by God and tied to one of the covenants. Right? Natural law are the things that are, that are by nature, written on man's heart, that all men are responsible to do. And then there are special, special uh, commands given connected with the covenant that would not be known, would not be part of natural life. They're only known because of God's stated special revelation of commanding it. So, Abraham, what would be, a, what would be the very obvious um, positive law in the covenant of Abraham? Circumcision. That is not a natural thing. That is not the natural conclusion. Right? I'm sure, like, I'm sure Abraham has some questions. You want me to do what? <laughs> now, that's not natural. That was, a, that was a positive law tied with this covenant. The Mosaic covenant had a ton. The Davidic covenant, the same. Now, positive law versus natural law. So the, law, the positive laws commands that don't rise from natural deduction or relation, but are simply from God's revealed will. Those are the um, positive law. When the law of nature and this specific command are combined, there you have the covenant of works. So it's when God gives that special command that is not natural to creation, that's where you have the, the unique nature of the covenant of works. What makes it a covenant and not just natural relationship between God. Does that make sense? Right? That's why we can say, it, you go, has this phrase ever bothered you when people say, oh, like, we're all children of God. Is that true or false? It needs some clarification, right? You go, well, what do you mean? Well, we're all created by God. Well, okay. In that sense, we are all children of God. We are all created by God. We, but we have a natural relationship to God because he's the creator and we're the creatures. Okay. But is that really how we, that's not really how scripture talks about all humanity. That's kind of a, that's kind of a hippie sort of phrase, right? We're all children of God. No, the children of God are those who are his by regeneration, not by natural generation, but by, by being born again. We go, oh, that kind of relationship, that's a different kind of relationship. That's kind of what we're talking about here. Placed in the garden, sanctuary of Eden, temple of God's presence, Adam was commanded to guard and keep the garden. By the way, these are priestly terms, guard and keep. And you go, is that true? Someone turn to Numbers 3 for me. Who's not afraid to read it out loud? Numbers chapter 3, verse 6 through 10. KJV? Yes. Who has the ESV and wants to read verse 7? Oh, sorry. Matt. Who shall keep guard over him and over the whole congregation of the Jews as a minister of the And you shall appoint Aaron his sons and they shall guard their priesthood. Isn't that interesting? The responsibilities of the priest are to keep and to guard. Yeah, I think it's super important. Adam's role was that of a priest. So now we go, we see him as king. We see him as priest. We know he's the only prophet. He's the only one receiving revel direct revelation from God. 
Here you have the kind of threefold office that Adam was, was playing out. No unclean thing shall enter the sanctuary of the Lord. Right? What happens if someone does that to the temple? What are the Levites to do? Kill them. Right? If any outsider comes near, he shall be put to death. Protecting God's sanctuary means guarding whatever he commands. The general command to guard the sanctuary is made specific in the, next, in, in the verses that follow that in Genesis 2. Listen to what, what Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, Adam, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And so now we have another specific command. All the trees eat from, not this one. The guarding and purity keeping the sanctuary is measured by Adam's ability to obey the commands of God. Will he obey or will he not obey? Now, secondarily, I'd say also, uh, this would involve, if something unclean enters from the outside, you should kill it. Uh, and that includes talking serpents. But that's a, well, let's focus here on the explicit commands of God. I think that's an implicit command, explicit command here. Uh, he's supposed to obey this command. And God gave these directions directly to Adam. So here's the priest receiving, receiving prophecy, the priest king receiving prophecy, receiving the word of the Lord directly. All right? Prophets then are required to not simply receive the word of God. What are they supposed to do? Prophesy. What are they supposed to do? Tell other people. Who was he supposed to tell? There's only one other person. She was given to him as a helper. Right? So he's to relay it accurately and clearly and rebuke anyone who would oppose it. How did Adam do with that? Did God really say this? I'm a prophet of the Lord Most High. He did say this. That's what he should have said. Instead, he's like, eh, the apple is good. It's not an apple, but whatever. Right, so Adam is given the priestly commission. Then Eve was created as Adam's helper. Adam and Eve were given the universal commands to multiply and have dominion. Right, so Adam's role is kingly. Adam's universal role would be, rule would be determined by his local rule. How was he going to do in the garden? Would that kingdom be expanded beyond that? Adam was supposed to guard the purity of the garden's sanctity by upholding God's command to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? So here's the covenant of works. Partly derived from Adam's natural constitution and the moral law, but then built on that positive laws of here's what you ought to do. Guard and protect the garden. Guard and keep the garden. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. All right? Is everyone seeing the covenant being made here? Adam must guard the sanctuary, uphold the word of God. Is there any reward promised to Adam for this? This is point four. God, is, God promises eternal life. I think the, the most prominent feature of the garden, so when you think of the Garden of Eden, what do you think of the landscape? What do you think of? What's the first things that come to mind? Okay, forest, okay. Why, why forest, though? trees right the the most distinguishing feature of the garden is those two trees really stand out right tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life they stand out pretty remarkably in this each tree plays an important role in the covenant of works adam's obedience was not simply for the sake of obedience right if a law is just a law it's not a covenant that's not what's happening here but a law that functions as a means of establishing some sort of guaranteed commitment well that's a covenant and adam's obedience functioned within this covenantal arrangement that gave promises for his obedience and the goal set before adam was pictured by that tree of life what is the tree of life if adam obeyed his creator in these specific commands the tree of life stood before him as this pledge of eternal life the tree of life was a symbol of what was promised to Adam's completion of his errand, confirmed eternal life and communion with God in his presence. Right? Um, you go, all right, 
you're asserting that. Do you see that in Scripture? I think we do. All right? Um, someone read to me Revelation 2, 7. So, what's your conclusion from what that says? What is the tree of life? What's the, what's the connection to the tree of life? What's the promise of the tree of life? Eternal life. Eternal life. Eternal life in the presence of God. Right? I see the same kind of thing in Revelation uh, 22. Right? The picture of the tree in the middle of the garden. And leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. God dwells with his people, and it's equated there with eternal life and that consummation of this kingdom. Now, I think there's further confirmation of this, in fact, that man's expulsion from the garden is specifically connected to barring from the tree of life, which offers eternal life. Right? Think about Genesis 3. Here's verse 22. Or here's verse 24. Or 22. Now, Remember, Adam and Eve are now expelled from the garden. There's a cherub put up in front of the, with a flaming sword, put at the entrance of the garden so they can't enter into. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever, it says. Verse 22. Therefore, the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. When she was taken from the ground, brought into the garden, he drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim, and a flaming sword that's turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. There's something special about the tree of life, the promise of eternal life that Adam was now barred from because of sin. And we see throughout the rest of the rest of the of scriptures how the tree of life is this picture of eternal life. This was the promise that God was given. You obey the stipulations of the covenant and you receive eternal life. So those later uses in Revelation 2 and Revelation 22 are built on this earlier use in Genesis 2 and 3. Right? Paul, Paul's comparison of Adam and Christ in Romans 5 indicates that had Adam been the obedient one, the result of his obedience would have been in the same way of Christ's obedience, the invincible righteousness of all those who he represents. Right? So even the argument that Paul is making in Romans 5 is like Christ, because of his obedience, brings eternal life to his people. He gives righteousness to his people. The implication is, if Adam had done so, then Adam would have been given the same thing. Eternal life to all his people. Adam was the paradigm for Christ. Paul's point is where Adam failed, Christ prevailed. By the way, in Romans 3.23, same idea. It speaks of a glory of which Adam fell short of because of sin. There was a glory which he did not possess by nature, a glory he could have attained had he been obedient to the covenant. Hebrews 2.10 picks up the same idea and says Jesus Christ entered into that glory and is bringing many sons to glory. Eternal life. And he's bringing many sons, his physical offspring as federal head. So. All right. Everyone clear on that so we can move on? There's more to say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't think it matters. I don't think it was possible, right? Because sin expelled. There was no access to the tree of life. Um, I don't think that that was, I don't think that's the conclusion. I think the conclusion is what was promised to you in the covenant is now cut off from you. And, and there's no way you're getting here. You're not tricking the cherubim into, you're not getting past them. There's no way you're going to earn, there's no way you're going to get to the tree of life. You're, you have no access to the means of eternal life. The covenant was given to you to give you access, and you broke that covenant. And now it's done. And you have no access to eternal life. You have no access to the blessings that would have come through obedience because you're disobedient. 
right? The only reason that Adam's obedience to the positive laws would have been meritorious for eternal life is because God was condescending to make it so in the first place. God did not have to offer that. God chose to offer that um, by way of covenant, and Adam broke it. The law makes universal demands, but only within a covenantal arrangement do promises accompany those demands. By the way, this is why good works don't save us. Because they're not, eternal life is not promised by means of obedience to a covenant. It's promised only through Christ. So the idea that, like, you can, so we typically talk about good works as, like, isn't that ridiculous? Do you think your good works are good enough to save you? And that's a true statement. But covenantally, it's even more absurd because God doesn't offer eternal life by means of a covenant of works. That was offered once, and it was broken. Now the only means of eternal life is covenant with his son, the new covenant. So, like, the, the promise of eternal life, the promise of, uh, the, pro- the idea that you could earn eternal life through your works is trying to return back to a covenant of works. That way is guarded by, a fl- by an angel with a flaming sword. There's no, there's no access to an eternal life through good works. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. Right, and, and, that's, and that's the way we typically talk about it is that exact way, right? Like, just look around. You think, you think any of us is earning salvation by our good works? Like, that's a, that's a fair way to talk about it. But if you think about it covenantally, there's not, there's not even that option. Let's say you could work up good works. Well, there, where do you think that's promised? Where, the, the, the promise of the Mosaic Covenant was never a promise of eternal life. So you go, oh, well, I'll keep the law. That's why it's absurd to think anyone was saved in the Old Testament by law, by keeping any of these covenants. The point of these covenants was to get us to this covenant. Because this is the only means of eternal life. There's, there is no hope of eternal life in any of these things. There's no hope. It's promised here, planned to promise here. We see, and we're, we're quickly getting to that point, we see how this, the, the means of, of earning salvation through obedience was offered to Adam and he failed. There's no other offer of, of salvation through obedience to anyone. Your only means of salvation is through Christ. Christ who was obedient for us, for us, undoing the covenant of works. All right, we've got three more to get, to get through in five minutes. <laughs> That's going to happen. All right, so um, Adam's banished from eternal life in Genesis 3. I think we can conclude with all that data that the confirmed eternal life and righteousness was set before Adam. And because such a reward can only be attained by voluntary condescension from God, that is a covenantal relationship. It is a divinely sanctioned, guaranteed commitment with stipulations, with a promise of reward. It's a covenant. So some people would say, but the word covenant never shows up in Genesis 2 and 3. I go, if, you have, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Yeah. Right? That's the... That, um, those of you that are in taking logic, what, what, would, be the, what would be the fallacy... For us to say, it's not, it can't be a covenant because the word covenant is not used there. What? You, this, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of the word fallacy of like, well, the word itself doesn't show up. Therefore, it's like, what, what, uh. Um. No, no, this one would, be, would basically just be that, um, um, that, be, that for an idea to be there, the word that defines that idea has to be there. Word use fallacy. Is that right? Word use fallacy? That's the word I'm looking for. Anyway. Give me another example of something where a word isn't there, but the concept is there. Okay, that's one. Where else? Trinity? Trinity doesn't show up in Scripture, but we affirm that. Why? Because we can affirm all the parts that make up the doctrine of the Trinity. Yeah. We don't have to use the word homosexuality to describe. That's a modern term that's describing a practice that's been around for a long time that is clearly spoken of in Scripture. That's so weird when I have, people say that all the time. Oh, homosexuality is never spoken about in Scripture. Like, that's, like, that's like saying, like, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, it's ridiculous. It's there. It's clearly there. All right. So that's point four. Point five. 
God, not only did God promise eternal life, he also threatened with sanctions, right? Sanctions formalized covenantal commitments. There was no affordance of mercy. There was no allowance for partial fulfillment. No admittance of failure. If Adam broke God's rule, he would die. The commission to bring creation to consummation would end in ruin. And the seed he was going to bring to glory would fall with him. Because as goes the king, so goes the kingdom. Because of that, God threatened Adam with sanctions. And the sanctions were carried out. In fact, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a symbol of the threat of the covenant. So you have there the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you have there the symbols of the covenant. The, both the covenant promises, the covenant, the, the covenant, uh, yeah, the, the covenant promises, the, what would be the reward for, for keeping the covenant, and what would be the consequences for breaking the covenant. Adam chose to eat freely from the covenant breaking tree. And it was this constant reminder of the necessity of obedience um, or else the consequences of rebellion. And he ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and he found out, right? Uh, number six. So to summarize this whole thing, God made a covenant of works with Adam. When God's dealings with Adam beyond that which was natural to him or considered, it's clear God made a covenant of works with him. Adam was placed in uh, a defined kingdom, appointed as a federal head, given a law of obedience, promised a reward upon fulfillment, and threatened with a curse if he disobeyed. That is a covenant. All right? So, by the way, what happens if we don't believe this? So you might be going, man, this is really interesting. But does it even matter? Are we talking about something that doesn't matter? You might even go, eh, it's helpful because it helps me think through how all things are structured. But is that all that we're, that we're talking about here? What do we lose if we lose Adam, the idea of like federal headship of Adam? Let's say we, let's say we disregard, well, there is no such thing as Adam in the garden. What do we lose? Yeah, yeah, just a few things, right? <laughs> what? Imputation of sin. If we deny Adam's place as a federal head of a covenant that would either vindicate or condemn him according to his works, then we remove the possibility of mankind to fall with him. And you go, all right, so if that's the case, we remove the reason for the incarnation, right? Like, I don't think people see the dominoes that happen. All right, if, if that's not true, then why did Christ come at all? Why did he have to be born as a man? What, what, being born of a, what, what is being born of a man good for? Unless there was a fall of man to start off with. If we remove the reason for God's wrath towards mankind and man's spiritual deadness and sin and tresp- sins and trespasses, then there's no point for Christ to come. We also remove the biblical framework for which to understand the category of imputation. Which is in Paul's entire argument of salvation in Romans. And so... Yeah, this is, this is important. Um, another area I think that I want to point out before we move on is it requires, we're going to have a little bit of caution here in that thinking that the covenant of works is somehow negative or bad. Do we see that, this, that the covenant of works is good? This is God's goodness. This is God's grace towards man. So even the fact that God has a covenant at all, that's, this is what confuses people as they go, for God to have a covenant with man, it must be grace. Well, in one sense, yeah, he doesn't have to do it. So it is gracious. That doesn't mean it is the covenant. It just means that all, anytime God would enter into a covenant with man with the promise of any kind of reward is gracious on his part. He didn't have to do that. So that's, that's true. But it does threaten death. I think it's only ominous because Adam failed. Right? That's, that's the, the if, it, if, it, if Adam had not failed, then it wouldn't be kind of the ominous, the covenant of works. Right? So let's, God's covenants with man are always designed to do good to man. And this covenant, I don't think, is any exception. It's good. The covenant of works was a blessing and privilege. That's the part of the word I would use instead of saying it's gracious. It's, it's a blessing. It's a blessing and privilege. An opportunity for mankind to dwell in communion with God is a, great, is a blessing. Last point. God tested Adam's obedience. All right. The covenant of works was not an unbounded, endless demand for obedience in the garden. It had an end goal. For that reason, Adam's obedience had to be tested in a definable way, and that took the shape of a probationary test. Right? What was the tripwire in the covenant of works? What was the test in this covenant? It's that 
positive law regarding the, tr- the, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? The, the, the hope, the, the reward is laid out in the tree of life. But then there's that other tree. Adam was called to fill the earth, bring it to consummation, and whether that would happen depend on what he would do with that tree. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, and so Adam was tempted. He was called to keep God's sanctuary pure and uphold God's word as commands. Eve was seduced by the serpent. Adam heeded the voice of Eve. He didn't exercise dominion over the kingdom that was given to him. He didn't obey the law placed over him. And so the sanctions of the covenant were, were activated in full. And his sin was imputed federally to everyone who came after him. And so Adam failed this probation and mankind died with him. All right? So, covenant, covenantal condition. Lastly, we have time just for this, man's curse condition. God told Adam that on the day he ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would surely die. Did he die? Yeah. Okay. Death. Yeah, death in numerous senses. Yeah, death in numerous senses descended upon Adam. That he didn't. It didn't mean he was snapped dead immediately, but death was certain. It was not immediate, but it was certain. He wouldn't. He was not going to die physically. And yet, and here was here's, That's the crazy thing about this is here is Adam who has there's there's no means reason to think he's going to die, and yet God still holds out the promise of eternal life, and some sort of greater communion than that which he had with him, and some sort of greater state than that which he had, which is hard for us to, to imagine. We are now here in this curse condition, and we go, man, eternal life I kind of get. It's harder when you're in this created condition. But yet the promise was there of some sort of greater fulfillment. Uh, The entirety of the earth being like the garden. Death in numerous senses descended upon Adam and all he represents, right? So death, physical or spiritual or both? Both. Both. Absolutely. Right? God told Adam that he would surely die and death came to all man, body and soul. Physical death is the first part of it wasn't instantaneous, but it was certain. The body will die physically. In a manner of speaking, we are all dying. You ever think about that? That all of us are slowly dying? <laughs> it's, it's like the most depressing thing to think about. Like, the minute you're, start, you're born, you start dying. Well, that's your lesson for the day? Go ahead, enjoy. Go ahead, enjoy. No. So, our physical bodies deteriorate and decay. Why is it that people get sick? Why is it that people die? It's because of this. Again, does it matter if we believe this? Well, yeah, it gives us a reason to understand where this came from. Spiritually, though, man is already dead. We see that actually in Scripture, spiritual deadness. Where do we see that? This, uh, sometimes I like to give little Bible quizzes here just to see if you know. Ephesians, Ephesians 2, right? And you were dead in trespasses and sins, right? Conceived in sin, born in Adam, we, like the rest of mankind, are spiritually dead. Our mind, our will, our affections, they're bent towards sin. Ephesians 4.18 says our minds are darkened by sin. Our minds, our understanding, they're cursed. This is the new natural for mankind. It's our nature in Adam, right? This isn't the nature that, we're, that mankind was created in, but it is the nature that we are all born in. We are born cursed. We are born under the curse of God. And because man is spiritually dead, he's unable to choose or do spiritual good. Right? That's eh, fine. Whatever. We're, we're, we'll be there by 11. <laughs> um, so man's will is not free from his nature. Man is inclined to do evil. And so man chooses, according to what he is, a sinner. And we're enslaved to sin. Right? And so... All right, how do we sum this whole thing up? Because we do need to finish up. All right, um, eternal death is the opposite of eternal reward, eternal, eternal life. Um, I've had questions recently about uh, eternal, is, is there such thing as eternal, uh, is hell really eternal death? Uh, I think that is probably maybe the most terrifying part of the curse, is that scripture teaches that when Christ returns and raises the dead, there will be final judgment. 
and the final judgment will be that of one group of people sent to everlasting life and blessedness, but the other group sent to everlasting death and suffering. In Matthew 25, Jesus divides these groups into two. They will go away, and he calls the he says, uses the phrase eternal punishment. It is a mirror image of eternal life. And so um, if you'll go, oh, I don't think hell is eternal. No. Like everywhere in Scripture it talks about hell. It talks about etern the eternality of it. Um, Revelation 20, same picture. Eter in eternal life, eternal punishment. So it's the opposite of that. All right. Um, what else do I want to cover? I think that's, I think that's it. I think we're good. Uh, so here's the conclusion statement. The covenant of works, therefore, establish and governs the kingdom of creation. It says under the kingdom of creation. This, the covenant of works governs it. And because Adam broke the covenant of works, all creation remains governed and thus cursed by the covenant of works. It's the inescapable government and reality of human existence. God, however, promises deliverance from this curse. And then everything that follows is what the old Reformed Baptist said, farther steps to get us to here. Hidden here in the cursing is the, the blessedness of the cursing. That God is merciful, right? At the very moment that he is cursing humanity, he has just given the hope of someone to undo the curse. So he curses, he curses Satan, and I think it's interesting that the order is, he curses Satan and gives the, pro, the hope of, of under, un, undoing the curse before he curses man. And so, Adam and Eve transferred their loyalty to Satan by obeying him rather than God, and now God has given the promise in cursing Satan that there is promise of life mixed in here. And we have, I think we have reason to believe that Adam and Eve believe the promise of life and the deliverance through the promise Eve because Adam named his wife Eve after this, the mother of the living, is what he called her. The fact that Eve, when she loses um, Abel, names her son Seth and basically says, you've given me another son in the place of this one, hoping in the promise that God was going to give her offspring. I think, I think all these are statements that are, that are done that show that they believed in the promise that God was giving. And we're looking forward to the undoing of the curse. Okay, we've laid the groundwork. I, want, I know we went a little long, but that helped us not have to start there next week. You can just jump into Noah after that. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for this time together, Lord. May you be glorified. Thank you for your gracious work to us. Thank you that though we are all dead in our sin, that you gave us the promise of life through Christ, your Son. Thank you for sending Christ to fulfill our righteousness and die in our place. May we, may we um, submit ourselves to him. May we believe what he says. May we believe his finished work on the cross, that we may glorify you. And we're trusting in, you, in that work for our salvation. In the name of Christ, we pray all these things. Amen.